Well, that's a, that's a good one. Actually, I'm going to give an example from my son. So he just, uh, this year, he was in the ninth grade, actually 10th grade, and he's, he's doing more about the Python learning. So high schools, it's a good opportunity to let the people explore what the programming that we discuss, what the contexts are. So high schoolers, and I really advise that, enable the students to see how they are capable to use a new building of the code and how we can write the code. Actually, and I get an analogy as well, like we are in the uh, digital native right now because most of the kids, most of the students are learning or exposing the digital environment day number one when they go to the schools. Like they can use the ecosystem such as mobile devices, they can use the tablet, they can use the laptop, they can use everything as a computer. So you know, the, the high school, they should really give an opportunity how this system is working behind the scene. How can I make sure that the students are learning, basically collaborating with the Google Doc as an example, maybe writing a basic a script on Excel file as a macro, maybe writing a basic script of get the, their, their job done. So like building the concept of how it is going to work and I can really get the, the students be ready of understanding the a reason behind it, understanding the cloud, understanding the operating systems, understanding the basic coding. And the, basically, like you can use the Python code as my son, he used it this year, writing a Python code and start to build up the, a specific example or the application for them, you can learn. So when we go into the higher level and the, high, the college level, we also think about how can I make sure that I'm building a software system eventually will be used in the bigger context. So in the college, we always teach about the algorithms, uh, databases, and other components, which it is good to have it. We should have it. No question about it. We need to understand the fundamentals. We need to understand the, how things are going to work out, what the best algorithms are. How can I really use the bad, better memory? How can I communicate in a short messaging system? So we can learn that uh, the college level, but at the same time, we have to tie ourselves how is going to use in the industry practice? We should connect ourselves more about experience, more about trying something. I always encourage the students, if you're in high school, try to build up something for yourself. Maybe you just can automate your, as the, your document sending to your teacher. Like try to automate that if you can. You know, maybe you're writing a basic PowerPoint, try to write a basic a macro in your PowerPoint and try to automate some of the visualization and graphics in your PowerPoint, which is doable. So think about how can I look, it's going to tell you to start some knowledge of the scripting. So when you go to the high school, the college, now you're going to get, how can I build up something that I can use and use my GitHub environment, open up a space in the GitHub, try to expose a more realistic scenarios, more realistic example. So what we are learning, we can apply in the real world scenarios. I see a I see a disconnect between because even though my students, I saw sometimes they know the fundamentals, but it's not as realistic in the real world scenarios. How can we manage that? How can we manage the users? How can I manage some complexity? How can I manage you know, basic writing code versus writing on desktop or sharing somebody else? It is more about experience. So I want them to think about out of box, think about the, how can they use different contexts more realistic. When they go into the more realistic example, they will learn how to build up the software. They will learn the, how can I sit that speed up the pipeline, which goes back to software factors. They will learn how can I reuse my code over and over again because they're going to write the code. They will see the similar code again, and they will think about how can I make it a little bit modular of my code that I can reuse again in the futures. So this is basically going that direction. And then, and low code, no code, one of the, the part in the questions, it's more about the reusable of existing application for over and over and again without writing so much code. And most of the, uh, even though sometimes we use that, like a, we're not writing the code, but using a shape as an example, we're using other ready solution as either drag and drop or connecting dots without writing much code, but just reconfiguring the application to serve our needs. That's going to help you. So most of the students are already using that, that direction. Another great answer, Hassan. Thank you for that. Uh, we've got a good question in the chat from Rajiv asking, how yeah. does container technology change DevSecOps? All oh, right, that's another good question again. Love that discussion. So when we, let's talk about the, what the container means so we can maybe come back to DevSecOps a little bit. So 
let's, I think uh, let's let's go this way. Like DevSecOps is a set of prep practices and principles for us. We are building uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous feedback, all this continuous term in the DevSecOps practice. So what the container is, as the little bit background, container is giving a, a process and isolated from operating system for serving a specific need. So it's basically a specific to the app content and isolated from others. I have an app one here, I may have an app to here, uh, both are isolated to each other, so I can do that. So going back to the continuous integration, as we said, we will like to automate a build as fast, as quick as possible. And also we will like to deploy without changing much in the production environment. So automation and deployment are the key element is helping us make it a containerized applications. If I my, if my application is more container, more isolated others in a small size of the Docker file or the specific features, then I can automate the build and I can deploy without affecting others. So in this context, it's really helping to speed up delivery, speed up testing, speed up automation. Because I can stand up at different test harnesses for this container separate, this container separate. I can run two of them in the same environment. None of them is going to be interacting each other as, as they're using different, maybe using a different libraries, different versions, same libraries. It's going to help us to deploy quickly. So what, how can we use this container? I think we should discuss a little bit more as well. It's about architecture element. As we said at the beginning, so you may be creating a one service as an application one. It may be a, one of the microservice that you may be writing here. So because you are getting more specific to the service that how application one or app one is communicating with others. Same thing for A2 and communicate with others. So you may be writing a microservices. So microservices is the way of architecting. You are packaging your services in the container so you can push into your pipeline. So like pipeline is we established, now we are adding an architecture components of the system that we are building and packaging as a container and calling as a services. That's the relationship. I can I can deploy it. Maybe one of the messaging services that I may have, maybe some of them a payment related, some of them a report, and some of them has possible maybe sending some message to other components. Some of them is just a database communication. So it depends on the service type. And we are packaging the service and put in the container and then ship into the production or deliver into the staging environment. So it is helping the DevSecOps go much faster by using continuous integration continuous data practices. If we don't have a container, yes, we can do the same DevSecOps practices, but we have the right uh, test automation. We have the right uh, deployment packages. Maybe have the right different build packages. Maybe have a multiple pipeline we set it up. So in that, that connectivity, it is helping to go much faster in the context, but it is important to make sure that we are writing the right container files to meet our needs. But we don't want to create a container file that's about the one gigabyte size. It's not going to help. So make sure that you are following the best practices, how to make sure that we have a right layer architecture in the containers. How can we write a, a very minimal size of the containers? We can go fast in the DevSecOps deployment and test cases. So we can enable the reusable of the components in the libraries that we have the layers of the container we can use that. It is really important to make sure that we have a right container architecture that we are following and we can use over and over again. Because otherwise, everything, put everything in one container, make it a five gigabyte size, it is not going to serve the needs of the DevOps perspective. It will be late deployed. It's going to be problematic to deploy into the production environment. 